topic and then we're going to open things up for question and answer and so it'll be an opportunity to interact and then uh, 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 get some questions out there have a little bit of discussion around uh, nutrient management topics that are on people's minds and so uh, with us today uh, kind of leading things here uh, we've got uh, technical support Phil Bongard uh, myself, Ryan Miller, I'll be moderating the session today. And then we've got uh, content uh, folks here. We've got Brad Carlson, extension educator uh, in nutrient management, water quality. Uh, and then uh, Dan Kaiser over here, which is our uh, extension soil fertility specialist in the Department of Soil, Water and Climate. And so thanks for those guys to agree to, to be the, uh, the first folks on our uh, uh, program for this season. Uh, that said, uh, if, if you want to refer back to the materials today, everything will get recorded. Uh, and if uh, someone didn't have the chance to tune in that wanted to tune in, uh, we'd encourage you to look forward to that. Uh, probably sometime after the new year, we'll have it all uh, up on the web, along with some learning resources, uh, kind of reference materials that you can use related to, uh, to this webinar that we're having today. Uh, from a logistics standpoint, there's uh, two ways to interact with us. Uh, there's chat. Uh, chat, uh, you can type in things in the chat. Only the people in the room up here will see any chat type messages. Uh, there's also, if you look in the bottom, uh, right about in the middle, there's an icon. If you scroll down with your cursor, a QA and a uh, icon. If you click on that, uh, you can use that to send in uh, a question. And uh, once we get through the uh, presentation portion, we're gonna try and uh, get to as many questions as we can today. Uh, if we run out of time, uh, don't fret it. We will we'll try to get some answers out to you uh, in a different format later after the, the webinar. So uh, with that, I think we're, we're ready to, to get rolling. Uh, do wanna mention this is part of a series. So we do have uh, five webinars. Our next one will be on January 16th. Uh, we'll, on that date, we will have Seth Nave and uh, Bob Cook uh, talking a little bit about uh, soybean uh, management. So we'll be covering some agronomic topics as well as soybean aphid on that webinar. Uh, but after that, we've got several others uh, later in the season and uh, we have more details that uh, uh, you can link to and, uh, and see those later. So uh, with that, I think we're gonna have uh, Brad, do you wanna kick yep. things off? Yep, sounds good. Okay, well, uh, Dan and I talked a little bit about how we're going to divide this out, and, and so I'm going to cover nitrogen, and Dan's going to talk about uh, other nutrients, uh, particularly P and K. Um, so the, the approach that I'm going to take with the presentation today is really uh, related to just what the fall has been like and what we might experience this spring. I think uh, it's not lost on most producers that this fall set up very similar to last fall. We've seen a few years uh, in a row that have been sort of like this. While we don't really know exactly how the winter is going to play out, um, it's worth at least having some conversation about how this last year, uh, uh, what all happened this past year for the sake of um, looking to forward to our management next year. So I guess there's a couple of things particularly when it comes to nitrogen management. Uh, one is that uh, a lot of folks who maybe had planned on doing a fall nitrogen application didn't get the nitrogen applied. And then of course there is a question, some of those that did get nitrogen applied, uh, are there any issues related to, did we lose some, or are we going to have to come back and supplement? So uh, that's kind of in the context of the fact that we've had some advances in technology, uh, both with respect to doing nitrogen applications, some of the fertilizer, uh, products that are available on the market as well as the ability to uh, assess nutrient needs in the crop as it's growing uh, through crop models or sensing technology and so forth. Don't really have time to go into great detail about that, but it certainly opens a window of, uh, of uh, what could be possible uh, now compared to what might have been in the past. I guess we always talk about starting with the best management practices as the foundation for how we manage nitrogen. I'm not gonna spend time talking about that either, uh, but it is the kind of the context in which we at least begin the conversation because uh, one of the things that we've really stressed with our nitrogen management uh, conversations over the last five or six years is the fact that we, we are not a one size 
uh, fits all and that uh, we need to look at uh, basically starting with a plan and then changing it based on what the conditions are like or what we're presented with during the growing season. So I've got a, a point on here related to long-term climate trends. Uh, not going to spend time talking about that, but I think most growers should have in the back of their mind that if we do start to see uh, years continually repeating uh, to the point where what we consider to be normal is changing. <clears throat> Obviously, the baseline of how we manage nitrogen probably is going to evolve also. So the uh, take home message I wanna leave producers with today is that there's not one correct way to do things. Um, what I always say is you should know what options you have available and you should also understand when and how to make changes and adapt to the conditions. And so that's really the, the point I like to stress. I don't have time to go into great detail about the nitrogen cycle, but it's important to remember that the uh, conversion processes of changing ammonium to nitrate and then uh, the loss processes also uh, are dependent on the weather, uh, particularly they are temperature dependent as well as uh, to an extent heat dependent. Um, the because they are biological processes, at least the conversion processes are. Um, and then uh, after that time is a factor also. And so uh, we need to play that into our consideration of, of how much time the nitrogen is laying in the soil before the crop actually takes it up. So um, like I said, uh, the processes of changing either from ammonium to nitrate uh, or the denitrification where we go backwards and turn it into N2 gas or biological processes. And uh, so the principles related to biologic processes apply. Uh, the loss of nitrogen through leaching uh, is not a biological process. That's just a physical one uh, because clay particles are negatively charged. Nitrate is negatively charged. If we have free nitrate, in the soil and we have an excess of water moving through the soil, uh, we will see it moving down in the profile and potentially it'll either end up in drain tile or into shallow groundwater below the rooting zone if enough passes through. Volatilization happens when the soil becomes completely uh, saturated. We have denitrification happening. Uh, in essence, the uh, bacteria in the soil uh, will, which need uh, oxygen, will take the oxygen out of the nitrate uh, instead of, of oxygen from the atmosphere, which is uh, where normally it would come from. So this process happens when the soil becomes completely saturated and we end up with nitrogen gas going off into the atmosphere. And, and so like I said, uh, biological processes uh, happen um, primarily when things are warm. Uh, if you think about having leftover food and putting it in your refrigerator, uh, we recognize that the cooler it is, the longer it's going to last. And so similarly speaking, the cooler the soil is, the slower these biological processes are going to be. So if you did apply a fall nitrogen, uh, of course, we recommend that you don't make those applications until the soil temperature gets below 50 degrees because that's the point at which biological activity slows uh, greatly. Um, the, the other part of that though is that of course, uh, when things start warming up in the springtime, then it's an issue of how long uh, uh, the period it is. And we won't really know that, obviously, until we get closer to spring. If, if the uh, winter this year plays out like last year and it stays very cold very late, we would not look to see a lot of that conversion happening. Uh, but there's also been some indication that the long-term trends are looking a little warmer. And so if that's the case, we could see some of that conversion happening. Uh, potentially maybe in March and early April, and then it could be at risk uh, for loss. Uh, denitrification happens when the soils are saturated for anywhere from uh, one to two days. Uh, as with most biological things, it takes a little bit of time to get started. And particularly, as I said, uh, biological processes are controlled by the temperature. So here's a little chart showing uh, the conversion of, um, of uh, nitrate into N2 gas or how much nitrogen is actually lost. And you can see that if we're in the cool range, like where we would wanna be doing, a, for instance, a fertilizer application, that loss is fairly small, but once the soil temperature gets warm, that, uh, that loss can be pretty significant. And, you know, we can approach close to half the nitrogen lost in 10 days uh, 
uh, if the soil is really warm. The point there being that if it's if you applied nitrogen last fall, okay, one, as long as it was cool, it's not likely that that nitrogen converted to nitrate. So it's not subject to be either leached or denitrified. And then in addition, uh, if we are saturated early in the spring, as is frequently the case, we will lose some nitrogen to denitr due to denitrification, but probably not large amounts. Uh, the large loss to denitrification happens when it gets really wet and, and uh, is later in the growing season. So if, if we have one of these years, like we've had the last couple, where it's very wet in May and June, that's where we expect to see a lot of nitrogen loss. So maybe not as big of a concern uh, early in the growing season. So um, I guess here's, a, here's just a little chart with some research data out of Wasika uh, from a project that was done uh, a few years ago. And the only point I want to make here is this has got measured nitrate in the um, in the uh, drainage water here. You can see that the fall application of nitrogen with NSERV uh, lost uh, basically the same amount of nitrogen as the spring application. These are four year totals. We added four years lost together. But what you'll notice though is that there is a a significant yield increase when the nitrogen was applied in the spring as opposed to the fall. And so since the nitrogen didn't go up the tile lines, how did, uh, how did we experience that? Well, it's clear that we had denitrification going on in the soil. So it is kind of a, an indicator that we still can lose a fair amount of nitrogen. In this case, it was tile drained soil, yet it was lost anyway. And so we uh, do think that on our heavier clay textured soils, we'll have microsite denitrification. So we can lose some of that um, over time before the crop gets going. Little rule of thumb as far as movement of nitrogen through the soil. So what we would typically say, and this again is a rule of thumb because it's really gonna be dependent on the exact soil conditions is you'll move nitrate through the soil about six inches for every inch of drainage that goes through the soil. So if your soil's at field capacity and then we get another inch of rain, provided that water doesn't run off, you can expect the nitrate to go down about six inches. This is an important factor also when we have wet springs because frequently we'll see that nitrogen end up moving deeper in the profile. It's not necessarily lost, uh, but it is going to require some growth of the corn, root growth uh, of the corn in order to reach that nitrogen. So that's something to watch for. I know there's been producers who have invested in a, a quote unquote rescue treatment because their corn showed nitrogen deficiency uh, the last few years, but in reality, the nitrogen is still there, it just had to grow to get to it. It's something to be watching for. Um, this chart here put together by Giles Randall a number of years ago, uh, the yellow bars are precipitation, the red bars are the amount of water draining from the soil profile, and the black line there is corn growth. So we can see that once the corn gets really actively growing, the amount of water lost out of the profile going into drain tile goes down significantly. And so really, the risk to losing nitrogen is primarily here in this uh, early season, the April, May time period before the corn really gets growing. By the time things get growing rapidly, we're seeing a decrease uh, very fast of the amount of water going out of the system. And therefore the risk of loss of nitrogen through that pathway also goes down quite a bit. So it's worth just focusing on that early season, maybe not get so concerned about what's happening after mid June or so. Um, just a few things I wanna throw out there that uh, in the past, uh, uh, rate, excessive rate has been used to mask other bad uh, management practices. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, you know, we don't recommend applying fall urea in large parts of the state. And I've had people say that, well, I've done it and it was fine. But if you apply 30% uh, too much nitrogen and then you lose 30%, it might look like it's fine. Uh, but in reality, we lost a lot of nitrogen. And so that's important uh, I'm, given the current uh, environment we're in uh, with sensitivity to environmental issues and the fact that as an industry, we're being asked to uh, kind of do the best job we can in managing these resources. We don't just simply apply excessive amounts of nitrogen to try and cover up uh, other problems we have. Um, fall application in general, as I mentioned, a lot of it that a lot of farmers who wanted to do fall application uh, here in 2019, but also in 2018, didn't get it on. Uh, 
I think we need to be thinking about uh, whether or not that's going to be a long-term trend. Um, we, we do see that uh, the use of anhydrous ammonia in the fall with a nitrification inhibitor uh, still tends to be an acceptable practice. The question starts becoming um, whether or not we're going to be able to uh, get that applied. But in addition to that, uh, I know you know I was talking with one of our colleagues, Jeff Batch, was saying that just some of the performance data as similar to the stuff I just showed is really indicating that uh, even that practice, while maybe the environmental loss isn't as high, you're taking a yield penalty for doing that fall application. I think producers really need to think seriously about that as far as what that convenience is of getting it applied versus the uh, yield advantage to doing a spring application. So I guess to kind of sum this up, if we look at uh, last fall uh, being too wet, you know, and if that continues to be the trend, avoiding overall application, but I'm certainly steering towards anhydrous ammonia. A lot of the research that's been done by uh, Fabian Fernandez the last few years is really showing that fall urea doesn't look good uh, at all uh, from pretty much uh, more of south. And so um, we're really thinking that's a practice to steer away from. And in general, uh, we just see higher yields when spring applications are done. Uh, consider using a nitrification inhibitor. I realize on the western side of the state that's not been part of our, our, um, uh, our practice uh, uh, recommendations, but uh, if you look at uh, the, the conditions that would be particularly challenging to loss, it may uh, pay a dividend uh, with anhydrous ammonia. Uh, for as far as the delayed spring field work part of this now, um, of course, we're looking at if you didn't get your nitrogen applied, you didn't have time to get nitrogen applied, uh, prioritize planting the crop first and foremost. Uh, if it's corn on corn, though, you really probably should get try and get some nitrogen on. If it's corn following beans, just get it planted. Uh, there's a lot of infrastructure in place now to get the in-season nitrogen applied. Uh, consider putting on nitrogen with the planter if that's possible, because that'll take care of part of your needs, and then you can come back uh, and uh, do an application later, top dress, side dress, uh, whatever that may be. Another point I like to make with things having been as wet as they've been the last couple of years, avoid uh, surface broadcast of urea for close to field capacity. Remember that uh, field capacity of moisture because uh, we want that nitrogen to soak in. And if we lay that urea on top and there's really no ability for the water to penetrate into the profile, if it runs off and dissolves the urea, it's going to take it off site also. And then you didn't get the uh, your nitrogen uh, applied, it moved off. Um, split application, of course, is a good option. That's been a trend in the industry. Uh, don't necessarily see a uh, improvement in yield in that uh, every year, uh, but it certainly is a, a very fine way to do your applications. And I would be careful of uh, top dress on, of uh, urea on corn on corn. Uh, we can potentially see some immobilization of the nitrogen and and some early season deficiencies of all of the nitrogens laid on top and there's a lot of residue there. The other thing I want to point out is if we have a situation where it's very wet early in the growing season, a lot of ponding and so forth, you know, go back to the things that I talked about earlier related to the potential loss of nitrogen from denitrification in ponded situations or potentially we've moved it in the profile and uh, consider what may the fate of your applied nitrogen might be uh, based on that. Uh, don't have a lot of time to go into great detail about assessing that, but it's, it's, uh, it's important to remember. And if we get in that situation in the spring, we'll be putting out information on how to deal with that. Kind of uh, some of the final points here, just a reminder, this is the, uh, the uh, nutrient uh, nitrogen uptake curve for corn. This was produced out of the University of Illinois. And remember when we reach the rapid growth phase of corn in here, starting at about V8, we want to pretty much have most or all of our nitrogen applied by that point in time. And so whatever you choose for management this spring, uh, your goal should be to try and get all your nitrogen applied by then. Uh, you're probably looking at, uh, in most years, the, about the first or second week of June. So something that will get that done. Um, as I said before, uh, be careful about 
Uh, urea, for instance, that's lying on top of corn residue because that could be tied up and uh, not reach the crop in a timely manner. Uh, something to be thinking about, and I guess the last point here is that uh, we really don't recommend making applications post about V12. Uh, we've just not seen the response in Minnesota. A lot of the uh, responses to late season nitrogen that you'll see reported in the popular press comes from places farther south with longer season hybrids and soils with lower organic matter. Um, in Minnesota, we haven't really seen an advantage to doing that. And so in a lot of cases, if you get to that point in the season, um, maybe we could do a little bit of a rescue treatment if you're really deficient, but uh, beyond that, that shouldn't be part of your regular management. So uh, just to, to finalize it here, uh, have a plan, know what your options are, understand how and when to flex your management and uh, play the odds. So. Well, thanks, Brad, uh, for covering the basics of nitrogen and how to kind of be adaptive with your nitrogen management plan. I know I, I just want to take a second and plug a program uh, that both Brad and Dan are doing, uh, Nitrogen Smart. Uh, they get into a lot greater detail and have uh, a, a lot longer time to really dig into that subject matter. And so this winter, they've got another uh, series of those meetings. And so um, we'll post a link to, to that series uh, when that's available. and. Uh, if you haven't gotten nitrogen smart yet, make sure you do it this uh, winter. That's right. Instead of the 10 minutes here, we got a three hour presentation. <laughs> uh, so uh, a little different situation. We'll be starting those on January 21st. And uh, we're looking, I think, at having 14 of those uh, in, uh, distributed equally around Minnesota. And if you can't get to an in-person program, they do offer an online option. So that's, right. that's always a, a possibility out there. So again, nitrogen smart. Google it, University of Minnesota, you'll find it. Next on the docket, though, uh, we're going to hold questions till the end. Uh, we've got Dan Kaiser up, and he's going to cover uh, P and K, and uh, and has a handful of slides there. So Brad did a really good job covering the nitrogen component. Um, you know, one of the things when I look at P and K, it's been interesting to see, even in my short time, although it's been a while here in Minnesota, getting close to 15 years, how things have changed in attitudes towards management, um, particularly of some of the the nutrients. One of the things about, about P and K that we know is that um, when we start looking at there's some basic fundamentals and one thing that I've seen is more questions from growers over time, particularly with higher yields, how, whether or not these fundamentals have changed. So it's one of the things that you know, I've kind of been looking back and going back to this back to the basics approach to kind of look at a few key things that I think growers need to really remember is because I'm not so sure things are that much different. I mean, we other than technology. We have far more technology now in terms of management, but in the end when it comes down to whether or not that technology is helpful, I mean really it, it just, it, it's kind of a guess and it's still based on some fundamentals. So can you see me? That you're not popping up there for okay. some reason. So I've got about five things that I kind of worked through. This is out of a, a blog post we had earlier in the summer. I'm just looking at um, a few things for P&K that I think that growers need to be aware of when we start looking at making decisions. Um, the first one is, is looking at the soil test itself and realizing that the soil test will give you the likelihood a crop will respond to fertilizer. And that's really what the soil test is is based on. So when you look at it for soil tests for P and K, they're indexes, so they're not meant to determine the total amount of nutrients. What we're really trying to do with these particular soil tests is go in and look at correlating these to crop response so we can predict crop response based on the values. So really the values don't have any units. And when you're looking at them, um, there's a lot of data that really goes into correlating these, these things. And then calibration is the last step that we do with these soil tests, and that's that step of breaking the soil test into categories and then further applying our, our nutrient guidelines based on the soil test levels. What does it mean in your soil test? I think that's the big thing when we start talking about this question is knowing really what does it mean. And I've spent a lot of time in the last, um, since I started here in Minnesota, trying to look at the data and trying to assign values where we can figure probability of response or expected time that pea fertilizer will increase corn grain yield. So if you look at the numbers, very low to very high, we can see that 80% of the time in the very low category, we see a, that um, an yield is increased by corn, for corn and soybean when we apply fertilizer versus very high, well, that drops to 7%. For factoring and just 
economics with it, then we look at expected yield without pea fertilizer. We see that there's, we'd expect about a 13% yield reduction if we didn't fertilize in a very low versus the high and very high where we're, we're near 100% maximum yield. So these are things to think about when we start looking at um, making decisions is applying it where it's going to be needed the most to get, especially if you're looking at full on economics of, of the fertilization. The second thing too, I, I really stress to a lot of growers is that the short-term reductions in fertilizer applications should not result in a rapid decrease in soil test PRK. I think that's one of the bigger fears when you don't apply fertilizer that your soil test is going to bottom out within a year or two and you're going to be back to nothing in the soil where a lot of these soils were 30, 40, 50 years ago before fertilizer was, was extensively applied where we saw a lot of soil test values. We know that nobody wants to return to that point. So the question always then is how quickly will we get there? And with P and K, since we know that we're not measuring everything in the soil test, that uh, when we start looking at the depleting over time, that we know that it's, it's a long-term process, even though we do know that there's some seasonal and yearly fluctuations. So we do tend to see years where we see bigger drops. The, the issue though is I think looking at um, over time, how, how the trend is going within fields versus being too concerned about specific um, applications. And, and if we look at sampling over four years, if that's a short term or if that's kind of a long term trend is where we see if you see a big drop in the soil test itself. One of the things I've looked at from a number of our studies that with phosphorus is looked at removal versus maintenance. So this gets at the point at which, um, you know, again, the technology point where we have the ability to measure yield on the go with a yield monitor. Pretty easy to make a removal map if we multiply that yield by a certain factor to get exact removal. But what I've wanted to really look at with many of our studies is look at whether or not we are actually holding soil test values with that removal. So I'm gonna switch my screen pointer here quick. So if we look at here, there's a couple things I like to look at here with this. Um, if we look at these two graphs, I wanna look at where you see a little bit of a line here, kind of in the end here, that's the trend line. Uh, if we look at the phosphorus applied, this is looking at over six years um, versus our change in our brace soil test value. So the couple things here is to look at where it crosses the y-axis, which is right about here, versus where it crosses the x-axis, which is right about here. Where the y-axis where it crosses tells me what's happening when I hit exact removal. So if, if I hit exact removal in those fields year after year, what happened? And in general, if we look at this, we're looking at about a one and a half to two part per million increase in soil test P over time with exact removal. Where it crosses the X axis down far to the left, um, what this really means is it shows us where we can apply to maintain soil tests over time. So what typically we're seeing is around 60% removal has been enough to maintain availability, at least in some of our acidic soils. It may take a little bit more than calcareous soils just because they have a greater capacity to fix and bind potassium. What this tells me is we have more flexibility, so we don't need to be hitting the target in terms of removal year after year to be able to maintain soil test values. But again, do expect though that we have, to, well, we might see a drop if you're sampling every four years, that you might see that um, a, the drop is greater for a, at the end of one four year period versus the other. So long term, we really need to look at this over four, eight, 12 or years or longer to look at what's happening to, to make a decision whether or not the management isn't um, effective enough to hold the soil test phosphorus at a given level that you're looking for. The second thing is then going back to that focus on crop removal. Uh, one of the things I've been trying to do since I've been here is look at garnering and putting together a database for both P and K for corn and soybeans to try to get a general handle on what the concentration of, of P or K is in the grain at the end of the year. And this um, graph up to the upper left shows what a frequency distribution of some of our phosphorus corn data to give you an idea of what that data looks like. You can see a pretty wide range in values ranging from around 0.11% P up to 0.55. Now, the, if we look at the tables, what they're showing essentially are the median values. These are the values that have been reporting in the new nutrient guidelines. So that's 50% values as the pounds P205 per bushel. But there's also a range, and that's one of the things that you have to realize that while we use factors, that the range can be pretty substantial. So in terms of 
targeting exact values in terms of removal becomes difficult because you don't really know in, in the part of particular part of the field when you're calculating based on one factor whether or not you're under or overshooting the removal. I think a lot of that goes to what we're seeing with issues with that when we're building with the exact removals is some of that uncertainty in um, some of these grain removal numbers. So I've just been reporting them though because the thing is we've seen that these new numbers have declined over time and that's one of the things that with increased yield and changes in genetics one of the questions always comes into play is whether or not we're seeing changes in some of these concentrations and removal and what we've seen actually is many of the concentrations decline. And there, but the removal values um, for K, we've seen that remain pretty constant. For phosphorus, so particularly for corn, we've seen that slightly increase. So that's, I think, one of the big things that we've seen with increased yield has been a slight increase in the amount we're removing with phosphorus. But I'll get to this um, in, a, in a slide or two when we talk about critical soil test levels that this increase in removal hasn't really changed our critical soil test level for phosphorus. So a few things to kind of think about there is that some things have changed, some things haven't when it comes to um, P and K management when we start looking at what, what's effectively going into the plan. The third thing, and you know, boils down to variable rate, and I know Brad has looked a little bit at this, particularly with nitrogen. Um, you know, when you start looking at variable rate technologies, you know, how do we use these to their full advantage? Um, one of the things I mentioned this before, since we do have yield monitor data, we know it is pretty easy to calculate a removal map, but is that the best way to go when we start talking about phosphorus and potassium management? Because we're really not accounting for the soil's ability to supply a given nutrient. And when I talked earlier about that probability function, we start getting into a high and very high situation. We know that it's very, um, very, when you start, like, it's not very often that we're going to see a yield response within a high soil test situation. So we have to be careful in, in putting on high rates, particularly if we're looking at removal of pea and corn, because we're essentially just supplying what was taken out of the soil and while that may hold or increase the soil test, it's not likely going to be economic. So with phosphorus in particular, one thing that we have been looking at are critical soil test levels. And uh, one of the things to note here is that we do define critical soil test levels as in different ways. Um, the traditional um, academic way has been 95% of maximum yield is the critical soil test level. Uh, some growers may be looking at trying to mitigate risk and maybe wanting to maintain near 100%. Maximum yield, um, traditionally the 95 really was in place, so noting the fact that we're likely to see growers applying fertilizer and it it's, makes economic sense to apply it at a certain point or maintain at a certain point where we know we're going to get some sort of yield increase from that particular fertilizer. But if you look at phosphorus, um, pretty close in terms of what we had for our recommendations. If you look at around our current medium class, that brave between 95 and 100 percent, that pretty much encompasses that medium class. And for a lot of growers that ask me about where should I maintain if I want to mitigate risk, um, you know, normally if you're 20, Bray, 15, Olson, they're slightly higher than what are on these tables, but if we look at different data sets, we get different answers, but it's never really that we see that we need more than about 20 parts per million. So that's the main thing with um, this, and you can really use that when you start talking about um, variable rate technology to match it up with that probability data to start looking at a risk map across your field in terms of where is the greatest risk that you're going to be short on fertilizer and where's the, the best opportunities to increase profitability. It's, it's really some, take some of that information and do some of this. The main thing in Minnesota, though, we are only looking at two tests, the Bray and the Olson. Uh, the bottom graph shows kind of some issues with the Bray uh, because of carbonates in the western part of the state. So that's one of the recommendations. If you get above 7.5 of your pH, use the Olson test. If you are in a field that has variable pHs, uh, one of the things that you can do is use the Olson even with acidic pHs. So if the pH is less than 7.5, I really don't recommend switching to the Bray um, until you get below about a pH of about five. I mean, the Olson still works pretty well um, for, for soils that may have variable, fields that may have variable pHs across the, the landscape. So it's one of the things with that, again, we get questions at that times, and these are the two that are gonna be recommended moving forward. Um, we we're looking at some of the other tests, but um, these tests do not always measure the same fractions of phosphorus, so be careful because we can't take the same interpretations um, across all tests. One of the other things too, with looking at this, um, if we start looking at variable rate, um, there was some talk about 10 years or so ago when I first started here about maintaining high soil test P because this gives us inherent 
bump in yield? And that's one of the questions that we have looked at addressing uh, with some of our current research for both P and K to see if we can fertilize the low testing soil. So say you get into a situation where a rented piece of ground that um, was mined out, can you fertilize that and still get still get the same amount of uh, yield within the field. And what we've seen is, if you look at this data, this low, the graph, what it's showing is different soil classifications, low, medium, high, and very high. Um, we're looking at the situations with and without phosphorus. If we look at the low with phosphorus, um, this far would be the second bar to the left. Look at that yield versus the high without phosphorus, and we see that the yield potential is, is, is the same in all, all circumstances. So. We know that we're going to get a greater yield benefit in the low test and the medium test categories and that we're not really losing anything by not maintaining high soil tests at these, these given sites. So that's some positive at least. If you start looking at a situation where you get in, um, if you look at return on investment from fertilizer that you can afford to fertilize these low testing soils and um, come out ahead. We typically would expect about double of our investment back in a return particularly for the low category and the medium, it's not quite as good, but we still expect that to be positive. So that's the big thing on that when I, when I talk about um, using VR variable rates of the full capacity is really just use it as an assessment tool, looking at both yield, then also looking at both soil tests to figure out areas that you can cut, because that's really what you're looking at for evaluating profit is either increasing yield or decreasing inputs. And we're most likely gonna see variable rate really save us on in, the input side, because we know that if we cut fertilizer rates, we're not gonna expect an increase in yield. So really what we need to do is if we over apply, we're not looking at increasing yield. So really the decreased inputs are most likely where we're gonna see. So being able to assess areas where it's gonna make more sense to apply fertilizer really is, is the key, I think, when we start talking about a tips um, for figuring out and using technology and variable rate application. Timing, um, you know, looking at this too, and then there's always, then we start seeing more of an emphasis on fertilizing ahead of every crop in rotations. Um, we have looked at this in fact. Um, we had some 10 year studies looking at long term impacts of timing, um, looking at um, some different options where I had um, before soybean or all before corn in a two year rotation, a split application with two thirds ahead of corn and a third ahead of beans. And then another one where we looked at a starter application um, of five gallons of 1034 oil ahead of the corn and then the rest of the, the pea broadcast ahead of the beans. The main thing here when you look at this data though is you look at all these NSs. We look at over here on this side for the soybean. Soybean doesn't care about timing as much. And when we looked at it on the corn side, this is looking at a yield benefit when we apply ahead of the corn. We're looking at anywhere from about four to six bushels to the acre on field sites where we had an increase in yield due to phosphorus. So what this is telling me, if you're looking at a two-year application, as long as you get the rate right, there's no reason you have to apply ahead of every crop. And we look at this with phosphorus, it's pretty clear if you look at that with phosphorus across these, these uh, at least these two locations. With potassium, it's kind of an interesting story. Corn didn't care quite as much. There was uh, maybe one instance here at the site at Lamberton where we had a three bushel yield advantage um, when we applied ahead of corn. The main thing are these, and these are looking at soybean yields. We're actually seeing about a, about a bushel and a half yield increase to a split application or an application ahead of corn versus, or application ahead of, of corn versus the, the ahead of soybean or split. If you look at um, Morris, uh, slightly different. These are a one percent or one bushel yield reduction when we didn't use a split application. Uh, potassium has been kind of an interesting one where it, some sites favor a split. The majority of the sites, so if you look at it, favor they still favor the application ahead of corn. And I think by far and away you're going to see many of these sites um, where it seems to make sense to apply both your P and K ahead of the corn for a two-year application and save then on the the application costs on the second year. So it's interesting looking at that. I didn't expect, particularly the split and the one at Morris, um, we've seen yield reductions from direct applications of K ahead of the beans. And I think some of that's the salt impacts that the uh, potash fertilizer might have, uh, particularly the high amount of chloride that's going on. We've been looking at that with some newer, newer research to see if that could be impacting uh, soybean yield negatively on some of these sites, which would be tend to be drier and tend to build salts in the soil profile. And then the last thing are these uh, specialty fertilizer amendments. Uh, these are one of the things that when I look at it, um, you look at all the trade magazines, there's a lot of stuff out there that a lot of uh, growers have to deal with. And 
it's really wading through the information and seeing what's good and what's bad to assess you know what products might work which has been very few when we start looking at these products we look at a lot of the data and um, this is kind of an example of a piece of data that i generated that the company had on their website where they were showing an eight to three bushel increase over the grower standard um, for the product testing you can see my data would be down here to the left um, this is just looking at the yield data where indeed we did have some yield increase turning at the bottom there's no difference between the two rates though but in effect, I mean, there were some positive benefits of this particular product within this particular field. However, when I look at this data, um, one thing that I really like when I look at this uh, product testing data is to look at if there is a data set of a number of locations where it's been conducted the same way to see how many times out of 10, 150 or whatever this product works. Because we look at the situation where this product worked in one location, there was also we look at four other locations where it did. So if we look at the statistics on there, I mean, I can't say that it isn't gonna work, but when I look at it by far and away, four out of five times it didn't. So that's one of the things I think it's important because nothing works 100% of the time, even fertilizer. We showed that with our probability tables early on that even in a low testing situation, there's roughly 10% of the time that, that we didn't get a yield response to fertilizer. So, that's one of the things that a lot of these things seem fantastic um, when you start looking at what they're supposed to do. A lot of the biological products, the thing I can say is you look at the native biology, it's really hard to overcome that on that. So putting something that is um, fairly exotic can be so much of an issue. So I really, really stress for anybody that has questions is to ask questions on it. Because a lot of times these products, they've been tested before or the active ingredient has been, and they're just re workings of, of the same thing over time. So focus on the data, ask questions, really the best thing you do to make sure because they may be cheap and they may seem like a lot, but I really would be forgetting about some of my other fertility practices in lieu of putting some of these products on, hoping that I'm gonna get, get something back because um, by far and away, I think the, the probability or the chance of a return is, is relatively low. So that's been the big thing. As I said, it's just do not forget these, these fundamental pr principles and start getting into some of these other practices that, that really are unproven. And it's, it's been one of the struggles as we can continually try to keep up in, in, with the research and it, it can be a problem uh, over time just trying to test all these things because these, these things come and, come and go in the market so quickly and it, it's gonna be hard to test them and to get enough years of data to have confidence in what they're actually doing. All right, well, thanks, Dan. Uh, and I guess uh, we're gonna open it up now for uh, a Q&A, uh, and that QA uh, icon again is down kind of in the, if you scroll all the way down or put your cursor on the bottom of the uh, screen, uh, there's a icon kind of in the middle of, of your presentation screen that you should be looking at where you can type a question in and, uh, and we'll try to answer those. Because of the nature of the discussion here being soil fertility, it would be pretty helpful to have a, a, a little idea of where you're coming from, where the question's uh, coming out of, if you're in Northwestern Minnesota or Southwestern or Southeast. Uh, if you could give us some kind of frame of reference that might, uh, that might be beneficial uh, uh, to us. Uh, so we're gonna spend a few minutes and, uh, and go through some questions. We actually do have a couple that come in here. Um, so I guess we're gonna kick one, uh, Actually, let's go, we'll kick it back to Brad first here. Uh, kind of more of a nitrogen management question. Uh, talked about being adaptive. Uh, this question's come from South Central Minnesota. You know, a situation similar to last year where we had a tough spring, uh, where days to do field work were really, really limited and uh, we had to prioritize what we were gonna do when we had field uh, conditions correct to do field work. And so the question is, you know, I prioritized my planting of corn uh, and uh, how much fertilizer should I uh, apply with my planter? Well, I think the, the key with that is, is we want to avoid contact of the fertilizer with the seed. And so that's not a real easy thing to um, necessarily to know exactly as far as how far it's bleeding over, depending on where the placement is. Now the the uh, premium products that we use as, as a startup putting on the seed, I think the economics of them dictate that you're not gonna put on, you know, tens of pounds of nitrogen that way. Uh, as far as the other products are concerned, um, I have not seen, and Dan, you can, you can chime in here, but uh, uh, I have not seen 
anyone really apply rates at a two by two uh, situation that have caused problems because it's typically bounded by how often do you feel like filling the tank up? I mean, with infer, what we, what we typically say um, for heavier soils, no more than 10 pounds of N plus K2O. So that's really what you want to follow in it. As long as we have moisture, that should work. If we don't have moisture, then uh, half of that, you can have trouble with that. Um, you are looking at nitrogen. The best option is uh, to look at something like a surface dribble band. And that would be to the side of the row on the surface, so 28%. If you look at corn soybean, I'd look at probably around 30 pounds um, if you could get it on. Corn on corn, um, upfront application, you know, we've had some studies out a couple years ago where I used um, 40 or 45 pounds on it. I didn't have any foreseeable yield reductions versus a, a single pre-plant application with that, that split. But corn on corn is one of the ones you have to be careful with because you need to have enough out there, uh, particularly if you can't get out very quickly in side dress, um, there can be some risk involved with that because it's easier to run out of nitrogen just because of what the residue is doing for immobilizing the, the end itself. So there's some options there. Um, that's usually what I'd, I'd stick with. Um, in many cases, probably corn soybean, you could probably get away with nothing down um, right away. I don't know if I would, you know, with the way the years of these last couple of years have gone, it'd be nice to have something at least to carry a, to a certain point in time because I think the main issue you're going to run into while there are some options, particularly with spinner boxes out there, I mean, you look at struggling to get spraying done, then a lot of these co-ops are using the same rigs for spinners that they're using for sprayers. I mean, we ran into that a couple of years ago with one of our side dress studies, not getting out to about V10 or so with an application because they're still spraying and they couldn't switch over. It's, it's going to be tough because I think there are some options that we have, particularly with some of the inhibitors that are out there for in-season application, but we have to have the, the capacity. To do it and you have to have the equipment to do it so it's it's going to take an investment i think in equipment and getting people to drive that equipment to make sure you can cover all that acres yeah okay. just just restress there i think i had already mentioned that but what dan said that uh because it's based on the nature of the question prioritizing planting over fertilizer application is wise if things are getting pushed for corn on soybeans but corn on corn uh, you really probably should think about trying to get some nitrogen onto that before you plant it. Well, and you look at it too, the best thing to do is once that field is planted to see if you can start getting somebody out there. If it's still fit to get out, get the fertilizer and get it done. There's no reason to really delay at that point. Particularly with Agritain, we know Agritain works very well. So that if you're looking at surface application without incorporation, that's a, a viable option. And that's, I think, makes some economic sense to do so with that. So just getting in early as soon as that field is ready and getting it done. That, yeah, and the, the other part, and that, that's uh, just to add to that too, because this came up the last uh, couple of days up at Conservation Tillage Conference, as far as timing of splits, um, the reason you split apply is you're worried you're going to lose the nitrogen. If you didn't think you were gonna lose it, well, then you just apply it all ahead of time if you're assuming you're able to get out there. So th that's the same thought process with applying these split applications of nitrogen or coming back post planting is uh, the odds of losing that nitrogen that time of the year, while of course there can be some pretty extreme weather conditions that could cause that, things that I already detailed. In general, we don't look at a lot of risk of losing nitrogen uh, in late May and early June. And so yes, just get out there and get it applied. All right, so along those lines, a uh, question come from Southeast Minnesota. Uh, talk about your reapplication to the surface, uh, soil surface in spring, uh, and the questions about uh, how long can you uh, have it out there before you dig it in? Uh, you know, so kind of when can I order the for, uh, fertilizer uh, to be applied? 48 hours? Uh, if the actual urea, and then finally it says if the actual urea pellet has melted away, it's still there? Question mark. So you guys want to talk a little bit about surface applying urea and southern Minnesota. The actual DMP, I think, is incorporating at a depth of four inches within, I think, four days. Four days, days, yes. But it depends a lot. I mean, if, it's, if you've got a hot stretch, I mean, you, some of the stretches we see where it gets to 90 degrees, and Judith, there's moisture there, I mean, there could be some, some risk for loss at that point. Um, if, I think the thing is, if it is going to be an issue in terms of getting back out there and you're unsure, now certainly if it, you get rainfall and that's why you don't get out there, then it should be fine. If you get a quarter inch of rain, right. it should be enough to effectively incorporated, but um, if it's 
you just might say within a, I would like to get out there within a couple days if you can. Right. But if it's a rain issue, it probably won't be a problem if you get a quarter inch because it should be able to get it down where it's going to react and it's, it's going to be that's some loss, but it isn't going to be as bad. And the, the questioner brings up an interesting point, and that is just simply the, the prill disappearing. Uh, we will see situations where either uh, soil moisture will wick up at nighttime and it'll dissolve the prill, or you can see with top dress applications, sometimes later in the season, dew will uh, make the prill disappear. Uh, that's actually the worst possible scenario because then what you end up with is, with is a very thin film of the urea that's very susceptible to loss. And so just simply the the fact that you can't see the fertilizer anymore uh, is does not necessarily mean it's gotten incorporated into the soil. You still need to be very, very sensitive to that issue. Okay, so we're gonna kind of follow along this nitrogen vein here for a little bit. Uh, the question's to Brad, but Brad, Dan, uh, uh, the question here is, uh, after using uh, DMP raised nitrogen application for 10 years, uh, they tend to have only 10 to 20 pounds of nitrogen left uh, when they do a two foot nitrate test uh, sample. And they're curious if that's kind of normal. Should we be at uh, a 10 pound remainder? The residual amount of nitrogen is actually not something we base any recommendations on because of how fleeting that is. Uh, and so the, the really, there's no good way to answer that because it's dependent on the timing of uh, when you're taking that soil test. Uh, uh, the loss processes, of course, still apply. Uh, we're going to continue to see mineralization of nitrogen out of soil organic matter, which is going to increase the number. Uh, it's probably a long way of saying uh, we can't be sure when you take a post-season soil nitrate test if you're measuring unused fertilizer or some other uh, pool of nitrogen out there. And then, of course, the timing of that is such we don't know that necessarily uh, we've found what's unused fertilizer either. So um, if you're taking the, the, those readings, it's an interesting number to look at and analyze, but you need to keep them in context with how and when you sample that in some long-term trends, uh, numbers, that number is probably fine. So maybe on a different vein, if, if, uh, if we're looking at doing some kind of post-mortem analysis of how I did with my nitrogen management, is there a good way to go about that or better than the two-foot soil nitrate test? Well, we've got data on the basal stock nitrate test. Uh, that, that's also an interesting post-mortem. Um, you know, more or less we say if the stock is over 2,000 uh, parts per million, you probably over fertilized and if it's down uh, below two to 400 parts per million, you probably wonder. But there is, a, there is differences based on corn hybrid on that too. So uh, it's just a rule of thumb. That's another area where you're better off to, if you're using those numbers, establish a long track record and start looking at trends. And if you think you're doing something, uh, you're coming short, uh, for, for instance, uh, maybe uh, put on a little bit more and then take a look at what effect it has on those readings. And maybe another point you guys want to bring up, uh, when we look at best management practices, uh, the idea or concept that you bring up often that uh, you're not fertilizing for the average, you're fertilizing to be at least adequate in terms of your nitrogen demand, correct? Yeah, the typically if you look, because the, the curve that's fitted is a quadratic plateau, uh, the, the rates that you will see when you look at the nitrogen rate calculator, uh, those actually represent a larger portion of the time than just simply being average or 50%. And so uh, what that really is saying, if you actually wanted 50%, the number would be a lot lower than that. That's not an acceptable, uh, practice for most producers, they don't want to flip the coin. Uh, they want to know that they've got enough nitrogen out there most of the time. That being said, it also indicates that a lot of the time that's actually more nitrogen than necessary. And so uh, frequently we can cut back and see no yield penalty and we can't be exactly sure whether the actual uh, MRTN in that field was lower or we had some other factors going on that led to that. Okay, so we're gonna switch gears a little bit here. We've got several questions that came in uh, about banding of fertilizer. And the first question here, uh, it is, uh, 
speak about the cost benefits of placement of a band under the roll of dry fertilizer. So uh, I have a machine that can place dry products five to six inches deep. It does not do any tillage uh, due, it, due to it being a single disc opener, uh, but it does take power and time to stay ahead of the planter and get that uh, fertilizer put on. And uh, uh, so they're in a no-till or, or typically do not do tillage situation. And they're wondering if that's a, a valid thing to continue to do, or is it a, a waste of time and energy? Well, I think with um, banded, um, where we tend to see the bigger benefit is from the potassium side of things, particularly with reduced tillage. Uh, one thing with potassium uptake, we know that it does take moisture. And if you're looking at continual broadcast applications, because we do, we, we I had talked about this um, actually today at a meeting I was at because when you look at the plants, the plants are just big pumps for potassium to draw it out of the soil and recycle it near the, the surface because we know that there's a fair amount of potassium that's in the residue and it's just going to continually draw it up and then through that residue redeposit it in the upper surface. So if we start seeing stratification, potassium is the first one we start seeing problems with. Particularly if we get into a dry year where the surface soil dries out and there's no water to move it to the root. So that's where the banding, um, you look at historically, and I think we, when we start looking at, we're going to be doing some work uh, next year, is going to really come into play. But phosphorus, it really hasn't seemed to matter as much, although where you tend to pick it up really is in that early growth boost. And it's hit or miss whether or not that growth boost is going to give you a lot of, it'll lag a little bit, uh, because with that deeper placement, it's not going to be like a, a starter inferno placement where you're going to get that immediate growth benefit from that the plants coming out of the ground. But there could be something there with that. Um, I'm, I'm just not as concerned about phosphorus, but if you're going through and banding one, you might as well band them both. So it's it's one of the things we're, we're really looking at, and I think potassium in particular, if you're getting into situations where you're, some of your surface soil, you're getting a lot of stratification, I think that's really where it's gonna pay to do that. So it's just gonna depend on, you know, just the overall cost, and it's really hard. We don't really have any good data on that, just to know, but, um, K is really the big one I'd, I'd kind of focus on. And Dan, a lot of that uh, tends to be focused on the fact that our rates, our recommended rates still are lower for band versus broadcast. That's typically what a lot of producers will look at when they look at the economics of band versus broadcast. Just your comments on that. Yeah, we're looking at that. Um, we've got a study Jeff Edge and I have been working on. We had some some sites where we had were able to make some comparisons of band or get some low enough to, to high soil test ranges in there to look at it. Because as you go higher in your soil test, um, we tend to see that efficiency drop. I mean, really where it's most efficient if you're dealing with soils that are very low or low. So where they where the phosphorus works really well in situations where you may have a high phosphorus fixing capacity, like a high pH soil, um, where you it's not really worth to build it. So putting on something that's more of a sufficiency approach to try to feed the crop really makes more sense. So I think that's gonna pay more than it is um, in a, a pH, higher pH situation or a lower pH situation you see between like pH of six and seven and a half. So that's the thing we really need to identify because I, I get a lot of flack because there's very few states that maintain those efficiencies. We we're, we're happen to be one of them. So it's a question of whether or not, since those things were developed back probably in the 70s, um, whether or not it's, it's still true today. And again, um, low soil tests make sense, higher, you get to the medium and high classifications and your efficiency is relatively the same. It's just that placement effect, whether or not the benefits there. And I think it would be for potassium, but I'm not sure for phosphorus. So Dan, I think you just answered our next question up here with the banded versus broadcast rates of the P application on high pH soils in Southwest Minnesota. It, and hopefully that, that uh, answered your question there. Um, so the next, uh, the next question is gonna be about deep banding of fertilizer in West Central Minnesota. Um, and it's deep banding fall fertilizer versus broadcast and working in with tillage uh, from a chisel plow. So, Broadcast and work it in or deep banding fall fertilizer, West Central Minnesota? I think it just boils down to overall cost in the situation you're in. If you're in a, if you're in a conservation till situation, I'd probably consider the band option just because of stratification. It gives you an option to, for subsurface placement where you don't necessarily have that. The bigger issue with subsurface placement always boils down to can I use starter as well, uh, but you can't put that much for nutrients on. So it's always nice to have that option, plus a dry band, a fertilizer is gonna be more cost effective than a liquid because your, your cost per pound of nutrient is a lot lower. So, I mean, I think it makes more sense in that situation versus in a, um, a situation where you have um, 
uh, aggressive tillage to incorporate it because you're going to mix those bands anyway. So it's just easier for time-wise to go across the field and broadcast. There might uh, certainly might be some soils that would warrant maybe considering single year applications for crops that may be higher pH, but we've seen broadcast applications perform well. But that's one of the things I think looking at the band efficiency, it makes more sense that it would be more efficient out there with the, particularly for phosphorus with some of the low situations. But um, it's, you know, I don't think, I don't think you can come up with a clear, you, you could come up with opinions both ways. Uh, I just would, would consider if I had a reduced till situation, it's a good option for subsurface placement that keeps it, that nutrient um, less prone to being lost by uh, just uh, surface runoff going across the field. Okay, uh, so we got another question kind of relating back, uh, I think to some of the timing uh, information you were sharing, Dan, early in the, in the first part of the presentation. Uh, and the question is, what do you think about strip till uh, fertilizer for soybeans. So I'm the strip tiller, I'm going to apply fertilizer with the strip till machine. Uh, is there any benefit because of the, you know, I'm assuming they're using probably the soil warrior. They didn't really clarify, but. Well, I think, it, I think it, what it really depends on is where you're planning in relation to your band. And if your bands are going on consistently in the same spot over time, because if they are, if you're planning right directly over top of it, I don't think it really matters. That you'd have to put it all on at one point in time. Um, I know there's some growers looking at potassium more, and this is probably a good way if you wanted to put potassium on every year. Um, you have to be somewhat careful though, because again, that salinity effect and the chloride effect is something we're really looking at right now. I don't recommend more than about 100 units of potash going down um, ahead of the soybeans in the western part of the state. I mean, certainly there's some soils that it doesn't matter. But I've seen enough impacts where if we get a dry year where we see yield reductions, particularly with extremely high rates. So if we got to put a high rate on, I put it on ahead of corn really. But um, really the timing side, I said other than that, um, say we had a Morris, for the most part, it, if you look at the way corn benefits from the direct applications, it always made more sense to look at targeting at least something ahead of the corn. So I would really, you know, if I'm looking at trying to save costs, if it's your own, is your own rig and that you're going to the field anyway, it doesn't really cost you a whole lot more to apply or if the fertilizer is cheap and certainly I might consider putting some down, but you just, um, the, the only thing I, matter. the only thing I'd add to that though, Dan, is that a lot of strip tillers are going between the row every other year. And so that would tend to, you'd end up with, uh, with uh, your soybeans would be in the same spot and then your corn would be 15 inches over. So if you only apply during your corn, all your P and K would be on where the corn row is, never be applied where the soybean is. Do you think that ends up being an issue long term? If that's well, what you're I mean, doing? I think I mean I think the advantage of moving the band essentially would be the fact that you have a greater volume of your soil fertilized. I mean, so there, I think there's some benefits there. Certainly, because that's always the question. It becomes a little bit harder issue than when it comes to soil testing at that point in time. Although, if you know where the band is, it's a little easier because you can sample. We have sampling strategies for that, but um, you know, I think that's certainly one thing to look at. Um, I don't think I'd go with a very high rate on the soybeans because if you look at the numbers, it doesn't warrant it. And soybeans really don't get the band advantage that corn does. So, I mean, other than just essentially stretching it out where you have multiple bands with a fertility there, so you don't have a completely depleted zone between your corn rows or between your soybean rows, um, you know, really that's, I, I don't know of really any other reason other than just to kind of, just to, so you have multiple bands of fertility there. So it's it just something to kind of consider. I just, I don't think I'd go with that high of a rate on the soybean side. I'd maybe go with this. We were looking at a one, two thirds, one third split and that seemed to work fairly well with that. And as long as we had something ahead of the corn and it didn't really matter, the corn took a good, better advantage of that, so. Okay, we got another question here uh, and it's about source. And so in potassium in particular, now, uh, getting your opinion on potassium sulfate over potassium chloride, uh, realizing that potassium sulfate is quite a bit more expensive, but are, are there any benefits to the soil or the plant using the potassium sulfate? The, the cost is the main issue of potassium sulfate, and it's really hard, it's kind of hard to get for us in some certain areas. Um, we've looked at it, I'm using it right now for some studies looking at potassium sulfate versus potassium chloride. I haven't seen a whole lot of an impact. If it, does happen that we do see some issues with these chloride building up over time. I mean, really the main thing that I've seen with that 
is I can get around the issues with soybean with the chloride by not applying it in the fall or spring ahead of the beans. So I just apply it ahead of the other crop. So we can go, still go with a cheaper source and it doesn't seem to be as big of an issue even though chloride, the, the basalts are building up. It'll be interesting. I've got a study where in year four where we've been looking at um, 100 and 200 units of K2O with SKCL and, and, K, and potassium sulfate and comparing that to calcium chloride to look at that chloride component to see, you know, whether or not there's something there. Because it really only, it impacts beans more than anything else. The corn seems to be able to tolerate, you know, wheat kind of needs chloride or it benefits from it. So there's not as much of an issue there, but I still, I can't really see. We've been testing some other products. Um, Polyhalite's the one that you might see coming into the market. Um, there's some mines, the mine product over in England. I don't know what the price point is. I mean, the main issue though, if you're looking at a potassium source, it's only 14% K2O. So it isn't really a very good potassium source. So, and then you've got uh, KMAG is the other one too, which is um, higher concentration, but still it's a higher cost. I mean, the thing with potassium, I just go with a low cost and try to time my applications or put it in the rotation at place um, where I'm not putting a heavy amount ahead of the beans and it, it seems to work out okay. All right. Uh... We've got uh, another question here, uh, and we're probably going to have to wrap it up here after this question. Uh, uh, but just want to get uh, back to this uh, timing here. Uh, this person is from Southeast Minnesota. They're curious about applying P and K after tillage and fall. It's something they don't like doing, but they've t been told not to worry about applying P and K after they've uh, conducted some fall tillage, uh, and then obviously they're doing some kind of surface application of P and K post tillage in the fall. Well, one of the things that, you know, with P and K you have to watch out for is um, the fact that the nutrients are water soluble. So if you put them on the soil surface, you get a, say, a one, two inch rainfall event, you get surface runoff, it's going to dissolve some of the product and it's going to move with it. I mean, it's certainly with tillage, it roughens it up a little bit. So the movement's going to be somewhat slower, although you get to a pretty steep slope ground, I don't think it's really going to slow it down that much. So it's one of the things that I, I do suggest um, really that tillage is a BMP when it comes to fertilizer application. It can take a couple weeks for get phosphorus um, reacted enough where we don't see increases in dissolved phosphorus post application. So it's not a practice that I really like to see, although we know, you know, I'm kind of from Northeast Iowa and there's a lot of situations where they put it on the soybean ground without tillage and put it on the soil surface and it's it's one of those things that I know it's done and it's it's one of the things that we probably should should look at. And that's when I look at situations to try to mitigate um, loss. Um, you look at situations like over in Ohio where they really push no-till. Um, the, they've seen, I think at first with some reductions in some of the phosphorus loss, but over time that's increased because you're putting everything on near the surface and you're nearly not incorporating it. So tillage is not a bad thing to at least get the, break some of that stratification and try to get it below the soil where it's not going to be as prone to dissolving and, and leaving the field. So just be careful with it. Um, it's a, you want to give it enough time. I wouldn't be putting it on too late in the fall. And you want at least a couple of weeks where it can dissolve and where you're not hopefully getting that one, two inch rainfall event and runoff. Because that's what, what's really going to be the most. If you're getting just some smaller rain events that are kind of dissolving it and working it in, you should be fine after a couple of weeks where it's not quite as prone to loss. But there is some, still some risk there. Okay, well, great. Uh, uh, thanks, guys, uh, and everyone today for coordinating this and getting it put out there. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Uh, we really appreciate your attendance and participation today. Uh, we look forward to getting some feedback as far as how you liked it and how the technical things uh, worked out for you. Uh, and again, uh, everything that's recorded today is going to be posted online, uh, as well as we'll develop a little bit of a, a learning resource pack that, uh, you know, with some, some reference materials that you can take with you. And, uh, and utilize uh, in the area of nutrient management. So thanks again, everyone, and we're going to sign off.